Why do humans uh, engage in violence? Maybe because they're, they're fat and angry and sad that we're not going to survive and they haven't worked out and <laughs> genetic reasons. Who knows? Um, why do we cooperate in peace is maybe a better question. How has violence changed? Uh, are we more violent than ever? Um, if you, should we blame this on the media? Why don't we just do that? Uh, that's probably the simplest way to go about this. Um, depending on which candidate you listen to, it, it seems like a very violent place that we live in sometimes. Uh, our next speaker is a um, Johnstone family professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard. Please welcome Steven Pinker. Thank you. I'm going to speak to you this evening about the past, present, and future of violence, starting, logically enough, with the past. And the simplest generalization about violence in the past is that there was much more of it. I'll start with homicide. In many parts of Europe, data on homicide uh, go back hundreds of years, and historical criminologists have uh, plotted the rates. Here we have five different European regions with the homicide rate plotted on a logarithmic scale. So this increases by factors of 10 from the year 1200 to the year 2000. Here you see Italy, Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, England and Scandinavia. And in every case, there's been a massive reduction in the rate of homicide over 800 years, so that a contemporary European has about 1 50th the chance of being murdered compared to his or her medieval ancestors. Now, the way that, one of the ways that homicide was controlled was by the rule of law, which in uh, early times consisted of sadistic forms of corporal and capital punishment, such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, sawing in half, and impalement. But in another decline of violence, judicial torture was abolished in uh, country after country in a uh, cascade centered in the, uh, around the time of the European Enlightenment in the 18th century, including our own prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which took place right in the, in the middle of this uh, process. Uh, also abolished during the, this period was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, there were 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a, ch in a child 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Now, capital punishment has been abolished outright in uh, every Western democracy but the United States. But even in the United States, capital punishment is a shadow of its former self, as this graph showing the per capita execution rate from colonial times to the present uh, makes clear. Also abolished during the Enlightenment were uh, witch hunts, religious persecution such as burning heretics, dueling among men of honor, blood sports such as uh, bear baiting, debtors' prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Now, slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything wrong with it. Uh, the Bible had no problem with slavery, for example. But then, starting at the beginning of the 18th century, there was a trickle of abolitions that grew into a wave that eventually uh, swept the entire earth, culminating in 1980, when Mauritania became the last country to abolish legal slavery. So we've been living through a 35-year period in human history in which slavery has not been legal anywhere on earth. There have been not one, but two historic declines of war. The first is sometimes called by historians the long peace, referring to the fact that since 1946, there has been a historically unusual decline in interstate war, that is, wars uh, with a government on each side. The most interesting statistic from this period is zero. There, have been, there were no wars between the two most powerful nations in history, the United States and the Soviet Union, contrary to every expert prediction that we grew up with, that uh, it was only a matter of time before World War III would break out. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki, again, contrary to predictions of all the experts that nuclear war was inevitable before the end of the 1970s. There have been no, two, no wars between any two great powers since the end of the Korean War in 1953. 
No wars between any two Western European countries, uh, a fact that might even seem banal today because no one would ever expect, say, France and Germany to fight a war. But needless to say, through most of European history, the uh, European countries were constantly at each other's throats. I've calculated that there are two new wars a year were started in Western Europe alone for 600 years. As of 1946, that fell to zero. And there have been uh, no wars between any two developed countries since 1946. Uh, we tend to think of war nowadays as uh, violent events that break out in the uh, developing world between uh, poor and remote and backward countries. But for most of human history, it was the big rich countries that were constantly at each other's throats. And because they could afford big destructive armies, those wars did a lot of damage. Uh, in a process that, that I call the New Peace, since 1990, globally, not just in Europe, there have been fewer wars of all kinds, uh, fewer civil wars and few war, fewer wars between poor countries, and a lower overall rate of death from war. Let me show you that in a stacked layer graph from 1946 to 2008. Here we have the rate of death from colonial wars, which tapered off to zero as European empires divested themselves of their overseas colonies. This is the rate of death from Interstate wars, country against country, with spikes for Korea, Vietnam, and uh, Iran, Iraq, but um, uh, sputtering out to a very low rate. Uh, here we have the rate of death from civil wars and from internationalized civil wars, where some uh, other country butts in, usually to defend the, uh, the government. So while there's been a somewhat sickening roller coaster of ups and downs in the rate of death in war, the overall trajectory has been uh, downward. And we have a thin laminate of layers here in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, there have been declines in violence against women and children. Here we have uh, data on the rate of rape in the United States from 1973 to 2008. The, uh, this has gotten no attention whatsoever in the press, but the rate of rape in the United States has declined by 75% uh, in those decades. There have been similar declines in the rate of domestic violence, particularly uh, husbands and uh, boyfriends beating up wives and girlfriends. Uh, corporal punishment has been in um, steady decline. That is, schools being able to paddle or strap students. That's the number of states that permit it. And uh, these are some of many uh, quantitative declines of violence that uh, I have documented. And I've given you just a, a sample of some of the more salient ones. Raising the question of why has violence declined over so many scales of time and magnitude? Um, and in uh, a book I published five years ago, The Better Angels of Our Nature, um, I suggest, and this, this will bring us to evolution, one of the, uh, the themes of this evening, that evolution has installed in humans uh, not one, but a number of motives that incline us toward violence. There's pure exploitation, eliminating or harming a person that happens to be an obstacle on the path that's some, to something that you want. There's a very different motive of uh, dominance, which my colleague Richard Rangham has uh, documented uh, clearly in some of our uh, primate relatives. There is the motive of revenge, in which violence is, uh, appears not just permissible but mandatory. You should not let someone get away with committing some sin. And then there are ideologies that justify violence. Humans are endlessly creative, and some of the belief systems that we cook up make uh, violence uh, the route to a better or indeed a perfect world. And they can cause massive amounts of violence in pursuit of those utopias. That sounds pretty depressing until we re recall that uh, evolution has also fitted us with a number of motives that um, inhibit us from violence, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, such as empathy, the ability to feel others' pain, self-control, the ability to inhibit impulses toward violence before they erupt in actual behavior, norms and taboos that govern what a decent person in a uh, culture feels that they can do, and reason, the application of cognitive processes to reduce rates of violence. And what I suggested is that over the course of history, our institutions and norms have increasingly brought out our better angels, such as democratic government, which prevents people from preying uh, on each other without preying on the people itself, a, uh, a narrow path that we uh, sometimes can negotiate. Uh, commerce, an infrastructure of trade, uh, makes it cheaper to buy things than to steal them, and makes other people more valuable to you alive than dead. You don't kill your customers. 
Uh, the media, the, the uh, expansion of journalism and uh, movies and fiction and um, uh, autobiographies can uh, expand our circle of empathy by making us uh, get into the habit of putting ourselves in other people's shoes and seeing the world from their uh, vantage point, which might make it harder to um, demonize and dehumanize them. And education and expertise, which allow us to apply our faculty of reason and treat violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Uh, let me switch now to violence in the present. And since The Better Angels of Our Nature was published five years ago, there have been a number of events that might cause one to doubt the historical trajectory that I tried to document. There is the rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. There has been a, a new war in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine. There have been uh, episodes of violence in American streets, including uh, the, the one we just heard about in Charlotte. Uh, and there have been a number of highly publicized school shootings, all of which raise the question of, uh, did I just catch the world on a, at a lucky moment? Did, I just, uh, did the, all these curves just fortuitously hit bottom, and I capitalized on that moment to get my, my book out uh, uh, six years ago? Well, the way not to answer the question is to read the news, uh, because the news is a systematically misleading way to understand the world. How does the human mind intuitively assess risk? Again, this is a question that uh, very much hinges on our evolutionary history. The great psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman proposed that our prime risk assessment mechanism is a, uh, an availability heuristic. Namely, the easier it is to imagine or remember an example, the more likely the human brain estimates that kind of event to be. And so, uh, we fear things that are salient and easy to recall and imagine. We, uh, many people are afraid of flying. Uh, people stay out of the water if uh, there's been a report of a shark attack or if they've just seen Jaws. Uh, we fear nuclear accidents, uh, which, uh, which rarely happen and kill very few people. Far more than car crashes, which kill a lot of people, falling down the stairs uh, or using a combustion heater or portable generator indoors. Um, so what happens when the availability heuristic is fed by the news? Well, you get the impression that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been, and people have been saying that for decades, perhaps uh, forever. The cure for these cognitive and journalistic biases is data. That is, how many bad things happen as a proportion of the number of opportunities, and has that proportion changed over time? Well, first, the bad news. And that is, in the last uh, five years, we have seen an increase in the rate of death from uh, war. Um, here you see it, uh, mostly attributable to the horrific civil war in uh, Syria. But you can also see that it has wiped out maybe 15 years of progress, and it has not taken us to the level of uh, death in war from the 1980s, the 1970s, or the early 1950s. But this certainly is a disheartening development. Uh, now for the good news, which is that that's the only bad news. Uh, for example, if you look at the classic, old-fashioned, traditional uh, form of war, two countries amassing their tanks on the battlefield or engaging in naval battles, country against country, that has, rem I'm sorry, the uh, vertical line shows the date in which the data were closed when I wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, the number of interstate wars uh, continues to be zero. There hasn't been one since the American invasion of Iraq. Uh, capital punishment continues to be uh, in decline. This is the number of countries that have abolished capital punishment since 1860, and it continues to climb, according to one projection. If current trends continue, there's no guarantee that they, they will, that capital punishment will vanish from the face of the earth by 2026. Uh, again, the United States is a, uh, an exception to this trend, but perhaps not for much longer. Here you have the American execution rate, and uh, many experts are predicting that it's only a matter of time before capital punishment will disappear from the United States. The homicide rate, contrary to a lot of uh, hysteria whipped up by certain politicians, has been in uh, decline. Uh, here you have a graph from uh, the 1960s when the United States um, suffered through a big increase in crime, uh, showing that we had not one but two de uh, crime declines in the um, 1990s and again 
uh, after 2006. And so the rate of homicide in the United States is the lowest that it's uh, been since the early 1960s. Uh, this appears to be a global trend with certain local exceptions, particularly in um, northern Latin America. But overall, the rate of homicide for the world continues to uh, creep downward. Violence against women, at least in the United States, continues to decline. Again, this is when I close the books on the better angels of our nature and the rate of intimate partner violence and uh, rape have declined since then. Violence against children, uh, once again, it was not just a uh, fluke that, uh, that, that the rate had gone down when I uh, finished the book, but rates of violent victimization at school, including the much publicized bullying, rates of physical abuse, sexual abuse, have uh, continued their downward trend. So to sum up, uh, uh, basically Bashar Assad, radical Islamists, and Vladimir Putin have erased 15 of the last 25 years of progress in the decline of civil war. But all the other declines have persisted or continued. Interstate war, homicide, capital punishment, violence against women, violence against uh, children. Uh, what about the future of violence? I promised that in the title. Well, th there is a saying that social scientists should never try to predict the future. We have enough trouble predicting the past. <laughs> and speaking of angels, there's another saying that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So here I go. Uh, I, I do not have the gift of prophecy. I have no idea what will happen in the future. But I'll just lay out some uh, possibilities that, that um, um, uh, I think people do not consider enough. Some history tells us that some forms of violence, once abolished, stay abolished. Human sacrifice being the most prominent example. Every ancient civilization practiced human sacrifice, threw a var virgin into a volcano to uh, pray for, for better weather. Uh, every Civilization uh, did away with human sacrifice, and that's not likely to come back anytime soon. Uh, cannibalism, uh, widespread, and I know that, that uh, Richard has written a, a little bit about that, but uh, once that's out, that tends to not come back. Uh, eunuchism, I don't think that's going to return. Chattel slavery, again, we, I don't think we're going to see a return of slave markets, uh, debtors' prisons, and uh, public torture executions in legitimate states. Uh, which holds out at least the possibility that there are other categories of violence that could go the way of eunuchism and um, human sacrifice. It is not inconceivable, again, I'm not prophesying that this will happen, but it is not inconceivable that interstate war could go the way of slave auctions. There are only uh, 190 players that have to be convinced that this is a uh, barbaric practice, and we've seen uh, a lot of evidence that that is a, a trend in which the world is going. Forms of violent punishment, uh, capital punishment and corporal punishment. Um, uh, punishment of vic victimless acts. I think we're seeing an ongoing trend where homosexuality will soon be uh, decriminalized, or well, I shouldn't say soon, will, might be decriminalized all over the world and uh, perhaps even drug possession. There are other categories of violence that almost certainly will not disappear, but could continue to decline quantitatively. I think that homicide and other violent crimes within states are likely to continue their de decline as we become cleverer about how to control it. Violence against women globally, includes particularly domestic violence and rape, and violence against children globally, such as child abuse and bullying, all of which have been the target of uh, global declarations from the United Nations and other intergovernmental organizations. Uh, there are other categories of violence which probably will not decrease anytime soon. There's, um, uh, civil wars are much harder to stamp out than interstate wars, if for no other reason than that there are thousands of potential uh, participants. All it takes is a uh, group of uh, young men with uh, access to weapons, and you can have the popular front for the liberation of whatever. Uh, and as one expert put it, looking at the uh, development that I showed on the graph on the rise of civil wars over the last five years, uh, he predicted, I think accurately, it's neither a blip, it's not going to return to baseline uh, quickly, nor a trend. There are a number of reasons why it's unlikely to uh, continue to increase. The demographic factors that predict the onset of civil wars, such as youth bulges, such as uh, extreme poverty, such as uh, illiteracy and education, those trends are moving in positive directions. Uh, and there are other categories that I think uh, will, are unlikely to decrease any time soon, most salient of which is cheap, 
low-death, high-publicity violence. That is exploiting the media to grab a chunk of the world's attention by killing a number of innocent people in a flamboyant way in a short period of time, namely terrorism and rampage shootings, where we've set up an incentive structure that it's going to be irresistible that uh, people with a grievance or pathetic losers that want to, as we say, make a difference, even if it's only enjoyed in the anticipation, we've given them the route to claim the world's attention. And uh, I suspect that it is, they're likely to continue to exploit it for some time to come. On the other hand, the death toll from terrorism is a tiny fraction of the death toll from all the other forms of violence, to say nothing uh, of other forms of preventable death, such as accidents and uh, morbidity. The biggest question of all is why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? Is there a common dynamic that has caused the violence reductions in the past and which might be hoped to cause more reductions uh, in the future? Uh, perhaps. Violence is what game theorists might call a social dilemma. That is, it is always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but of course the damage done to the victim exceeds the, uh, the I'm sorry, the harm done to the victim exceeds the advantage gained by the aggressor. Now, in the long run, since aggressors can become victims and vice versa, rationally, we'd all be better off if we could all agree to abjure violence. The dilemma is, how do you get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time that you do? Because if you beat your swords into plowshares, but the other guy keeps his swords as swords, then you could be uh, a, a, a permanent punching bag. You could be um, a, uh, find yourself at the wrong end of an invading army. It's not implausible to think that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually chipped away at this problem, uh, as we have dealt with other scourges of the human condition, like pestilence and hunger, and that violence reduction may be like other kinds of technical, technological progress that is not linear, not inexorable, but likely over the long run. Thank you very much.